Uh, hello, uh, Raleigh, thanks for the intro. I want to also thank you for your help in putting this uh, slideshow together on Zoom. Uh, I'm pleased to be asked by the Hurley Heritage uh, Society uh, to speak tonight and pleased to see members of that society and also so many other uh, members of our community. Uh, there are a lot of people here that taught me a lot about Bluestone. I hope I can meet their expectations here tonight. Um, specifically, Lowell Thing uh, showed me uh, the Bluestone industry starting uh, many years ago uh, down in Wilbur and taking me on a tour throughout Ulster County. Um, Frank Almquist has been very helpful. Um, it's, I'm just very appreciative of all those folks that I've interacted with in the past who are, who are here tonight. So let's get started. I'm gonna have to, uh, I have a little technical problem. I've gotta go back here. Oops. I think I have a frozen screen here, Raleigh. So I, I think I'll probably have to reboot here, unfortunately. There we go. Good. Can all of you see the Hurley Church? Yes. <laughs> You're all in, in mute, you are. Um, what I thought we'd do is to start. I'm on mute. The... Wait, what's up? Oh, is it good? I don't know. We just started. I thought we'd start in uh, the village of Hurley and look at some of the bluestone remnants that are here. Uh, and I'll show you how ubiquitous in all our communities uh, bluestone is. Aye. 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 I'm having a problem, unfortunately, Raleigh. Uh is it on play? Did you hit the play button? Yeah, I'm on play. Um, the mouse isn't responding. Can't see. I'm having a, there. Yes, there let's, let's see how we can do. Let's see if it works. Um, as you can see, uh, this is the front of the, the Hurley Church. And uh, there's a beautiful uh, stone steps that are in front of the church. Um, that stone on the, on the platform in front of the church uh, is large. Uh, it measures about uh, eight feet, seven inches by six feet and by four inches. Uh, the church dates back to 1854. Uh, uh, I don't know when uh, this, uh, this stone was placed, but it's possible it could have been done in the 1850s because bluestone, the bluestone industry was active uh, at that time. Uh, you've seen this. Uh, this sign at the entrance to the old uh, Hur Hurley uh, burial ground. And the burial ground uh, has stones apparently that dates back to 1713. And there are many uh, blue stones within the Hurley Cemetery. For example, uh, this blue stone, uh, this small little obelisk uh, is dated uh, 1719. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's over 300 years old. And uh, even though it's that old, you can still read the script, still read the letters and the dates that are, that are on that stone. Um, this is a, a beautiful uh, blue stone uh, gravestone within this Hurley Cemetery. Uh, and it says, uh, in memory of Getty Du Bois, uh, who departed this life uh, July 26, uh, 1823, age 20 years. And there's a beautiful little poem below it. Um, to me, uh, this is really an incredible uh, stone. It shows you that for 200 years, uh, there's really been no deterioration uh, in this blue stone. So it's a very hard, compact surface um, that uh, people can engrave with. Um, the other point to make here, I think, is when did blue stone quarrying start uh, in Ulster County and the town of Hurley? Uh, and uh, the date is given as a commercial date of 1831, starting in the veteran area of Sorgates by a, a man named Brainerd. 
And uh, if, you, if you think of that, this stone is from 1823. So obviously there were small quarries, there were people probably working individually that were quarrying uh, bluestone before that uh, initial commercial application. Uh, it's said that in, uh, in Ulster County, perhaps it was a man named Moray on Moray Hill Road in the town of Ulster uh, that perhaps uh, was one of the first people in the 1820s to start uh, the bluestone industry. Uh, you'll recognize this is the Polychrist Bell House, and there's some neat features here. Uh, there's a bluestone curb, uh, there's a bluestone sidewalk. And then underneath the door, you'll see a door sill of blue stone. And below that, uh, you'll see another stone, another blue stone. And uh, that blue stone is actually a millstone. And uh, what, was, what was the purpose of that stone? Was it truly a millstone? Did it grind grain? Uh, or another possibility could be that uh, a wagon maker, a wagon repairman uh, could have used that to put a wagon wheel in. He could have applied uh, perhaps uh, iron cladding around that wheel to make it a carriage wheel for the bluestone trade. Uh, this is looking from in front of the polycrystal house, uh, looking towards the church. And the notable thing here uh, is the bluestone sidewalk. Uh, I'm not sure when this was installed, but it certainly could have been back uh, well into the 18. Hundreds. Uh, there's also bluestone curbing on this side of the street in Hurley as well. And the bluestone sidewalks are worth mentioning because it's really what drove uh, the bluestone industry. It was the desire of cities such as New York City to have bluestone sidewalks uh, that propelled the industry in the late 1830s when it really got started uh, and, and which went into uh, the, late, uh, the late 1800s. And what's good about these bluestone sidewalks? Why do people like them? Well, they're very durable. Uh, they're hard, they don't break. Um, and they also, they're not slippery. Uh, and, and if you have a sidewalk, that's a pretty important uh, concern. Um, they also dry very quickly. And as Lowell Thing would mention, they're very handsome uh, within your community. Uh, here's a photo of the Hurley uh, Museum, the Hurley Heritage Society Museum. Um, this uh, construction is another example of, uh, of a sedimentary stone. It's not blue stone, but it's limestone. Uh, and the old stone houses in Kingston, Hurley, and Environs were, were mostly all made of, uh, of uh, limestone. And limestone can easily be seen everywhere. If you look at Forsyth Park, for example, you'll see blue stone coming out of, of the walls and grasses near the tennis courts. <laughs> Uh, this is in front of the Hurley Heritage Society. Um, you've all seen this. Uh, these are portions of the Bluestone Road, uh, a road which uh, apparently extended from West Hurley uh, through Route 28A uh, onto uh, Route 28 onto Washington Avenue and actually through Uptown Kingston. Uh, there's a little plaque that goes along with this. You can see that on the right hand side. Uh, and you can, you can read this. Uh, it'll um, it'll mention uh, that this was part of the Bluestone Road, uh, now Route 28A. Uh, it was used by wagons to transport bluestone from quarries in Old West Hurley to the docks in Wilbur. Uh, again, only the down track of the road was stone, which makes sense because the wagons had the stones on them at that point. Uh, wagon wheels were covered with iron bands and the heavy wagons eventually ground the track in the stone. It always seems to be a question of whether those, those tracks in the stone were there initially or where the wagons uh, created them. And apparently it appears that it's, it's most certainly the wagons that created them. Uh, behind the Her Hurley Heritage Museum, uh, yeah. there's, what? behind the Hurley Heritage Museum, there is an a, uh, uh, exhibit which is dedicated to uh, the bluestone industry. Uh, and this is said to be a bluestone wagon. Um, Gail Wistons points out that Perhaps it, it could be a wagon of another, another type. Uh, in any case, uh, it's now labeled as a bluestone wagon. Um, it has been refurbished by people of the community. And also within the museum, uh, you'll see a pretty neat demonstration of how bluestone was cut. Um, you have what's called plug and feathers. 
uh, and the splitting is done uh, along the line that you see there. Uh, what's initially done is a drill uh, is inserted along the line, a drill hole is made, and then some uh, pieces of iron, scrap iron are placed, uh, two of these are placed within the drilled hole, uh, and then uh, within those two, uh, what they call feathers, uh, an iron plug is inserted. So you see here five iron plugs along a line that is going to be cut in bluestone. And so then you would pound those, those plugs and you would be able to split uh, the stone. Yeah. And the other, uh, if everybody could make sure that they're on mute, I, I would appreciate that. Um, and these are uh, wedges that allow the bluestone ledges to be separated apart. Uh, again, this is part of the exhibit in the Hurley Heritage Society Museum. And another finding in the, uh, in the village of Hurley uh, is a very large segment of the Bluestone Road. Uh, this is in front of the Hurley Library. And there's also an associated plaque uh, with that that you can see. And, and it, it pretty much says what the plaque in front of the museum says as well about the old Bluestone Road. Now let's head up into the uh, quarry country, uh, which was, uh, which is in the town of Hurley. Um, there were many uh, bluestone mines around the area of West Hurley. Uh, it's said that in 1870, there were approximately 40 to 50 bluestone mines that were being worked in the area. Uh, in 1870, uh, apparently there were about 1500 people within West Hurley that were in the bluestone uh, industry. And, uh, it, it points out that uh, some of the best stone uh, that came from Ulster County came from the West Hurley area. Uh, the stones here were, were seemed to be darker in color, a darker bluish color than stones in other areas. And they were uh, very much in demand for sidewalk material, but also for uh, construction, uh, uh, particularly of, uh, of wealthy homes in the New York City area. This is a pretty neat photo because it shows a pile of bluestone rubbish or tailings or part of the bluestone business that, that was gathered uh, that they didn't need. Uh, so when you, were, when you had a bluestone quarry and you were quarrying bluestone, there'd be a lot of rubbish left over, a large amount. And it would be pushed over the hillside, it would be pushed to the side of the quarry. Uh, and in some instances, uh, quarries would have to close because there was no way to move uh, this rubbish. So, it, so that's what you see in this photo. Uh, one of the mines and quarries that was outstanding apparently in West Turley was called the Great Lawson Mine. Um, Lucius Lawson happened to come from Kingston um, and he had some 40 acres of uh, quarry land. Uh, and over the period of 30 years, uh, from about 1968, 1998, uh, he ran a quarry which supposedly produced around $4 million of bluestone. Uh, he stopped in uh, 1898 quarrying uh, because he went bankrupt like many quarry owners did. Uh, he had no market for his stone. He owned too much land uh, and he actually went down to Tennessee and opened up another mining business. Uh, this is a, uh, a quarry pond within West Hurley, another, it's a postcard image. Uh, and like many quarries, uh, when people quarried them, it oh, ended up, yeah. Yeah. it ended up that they would have, um, that the quarries would be flooded. Um, so that was a frequent uh, happening um, when you, when you quarried the bluestone. So here in this picture, I think you see some bluestone tailings alongside of the pond. Uh, you see the bluestone product, and then you also see a mill where some early dressing of the stone, uh, was carried out. Uh, this is a group of, uh, quarrymen, uh, in, in the greater, uh, West Hurley area. Uh, most of these quarrymen, uh, were of Irish descent, uh, a lot of them came in the 1840s I'm on, I'm on the, the, um, with the Irish famine. I'm on the Zoom. If, um, could all of you check your mute button for me and make sure that the mute button is on? I would be appreciative. 
appreciative of that. I think some of you must have um, your microphone on. And this is a great picture. This comes from um, a uh, popular science magazine of 1894. And it's labeled Quarryman's Home with rubbish banks in the rear. Um, what I see here is a very simple home, uh, a lot of stone. There's some stone okay. walls that Quarryman has constructed. All right, I'll, I'll do that right this minute. But the salient feature is in the background where there are large uh, rubbish banks, which extended for uh, an, a large uh, portion uh, of the quarry lands. And this is an example, again, in the Popular Science Journal, 1894, of what a large bluestone quarry looked like. Uh, again, it's labeled West Hurley. And what you see is a large, uh, uh, top, what they call topping. Uh, it would consist of trees, it would consist of soil. There'd be a fair amount of shale. And these would cover up the beds of the bluestone. Uh, oftentimes, uh, these uh, top, what, what was called a topping would have to be blasted off by dynamite. And often this was done in the winter time when quarrying uh, did not take, actually take place. Um, you see that vertical wall on the left, uh, that's actually a natural seam. Uh, the natural seams usually went north to south. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you'll see two other uh, natural seams. These weren't created by drilling, these were just a natural finding. And then at right angles to those natural seams was what they call the header. So that's the flat surface that you see towards the background of the photo. And the header miraculously uh, in the Catskill Mountains was 90 degrees to the vertical side seams. So it made it a pretty natural way to, to extract uh, the bluestone. Uh, this is another quarry on the area of West Hurley. Uh, it looks like this gentleman on the left might be an owner there with his son uh, watching the quarry worker. Uh, again, uh, you'll see the vertical seam uh, and then you'll see the layers uh, of the sedimentary bluestone here in the pictures. There's one, two, three layers, the third layer being where the worker is now. And then you also see the markings where uh, the stone uh, was split. This is a wonderful picture. It's around 1900. It's in the Ashokan area. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the extraction of a large stone, uh, which is labeled 20 by 10 feet uh, by 10 inches. Uh, oftentimes, these quarry workers would just work two or three um, together. And uh, when a big stone uh, was imminent, uh, other quarry workers from other quarries would come and join them to, uh, I guess, to celebrate and also to remove uh, the stone. Uh, this is a Jack Matthews photo. Uh, this is another photo in the Ashokan Reservoir area. Uh, again, a big stone um, extraction uh, taking place. You can see the derrick in place as well. Uh, this is labeled 1900. And again, in, in this photo, you'll see two uh, others worker, other workers with a very large stone uh, being lifted uh, by a derrick. And here again uh, is uh, a picture of what was said to be one of the largest stones uh, taken to the Rondau. Uh, it came from a sawkill uh, quarry. Uh, it's labeled as 20 by 24 feet and nine inches thick. Uh, it's quite a stone. Sort of interesting to me that a lot of the pictures that we see of quarries are, are the extraction of the very large stones. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of photos of quarrying taking place with flagstones. And uh, I like to show this photo because it's a current photo. Uh, it's uh, of uh, an old quarry. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, a site that you all uh, recommended. It's, uh, it would be Harvey Fights uh, Opus 40. And uh, again, it looks like those other uh, photos that we, we looked at with the topping uh, and the trees uh, with shale and uh, other material below that. And then, then the, uh, the side walls of the quarry. If you haven't been to Opus 40, it's a must. 
uh, Harvey Fite was able to use uh, old stone, the rubbish type stone, and create a, a most beautiful sculpture. Uh, this is a beautiful quarry, which isn't far uh, from the town of Hurley. Uh, it's, um, it's located just north uh, of Glenford in the town of Woodstock. Uh, and it's on uh, Yerry Hill Road. Yerry Hill Road goes into Ohio Mountain Road. It's called um, uh, Snake Rocks Quarry. Uh, and again, you see how a quarry uh, fills up with water like it does here. You can see the sidewalls from which stone was already extracted. And then down near the pond, excuse me, down near the pond, uh, you'll see these uh, layers of bluestone uh, that have already been removed, and you can see the drill marks that are present uh, in those stones. And again, the rubber piles can be viewed here. Uh, the gentleman on the right uh, is over six feet tall, so you can sense how, how much rubbish was produced in Snake Rock's quarry. And here's a photo of two of the men who worked in the quarry. Uh, this is a postcard that came uh, from, from uh, Woodstock. So the next thing I, I want to address is how did these, uh, these bluestone uh, flagging stones and heavy construction stones get down to the Rondat? And they came down by uh, wagons, bluestone wagons that were uh, loaded with sometimes uh, six, eight, 10, 12 uh, tons of stone. Uh, this stone is actually on the Glasgow Turnpike in Glenary. Uh, but it gives you an idea of, uh, of what a bluestone wagon looked like laden with stone. And here's an iconic picture that we've all seen. Uh, it's uh, the Bluestone Road in the Ashokan Reservoir. So certainly near uh, West Hurley. This is at the time of a drought. Uh, and you can see those very large uh, stones that are there over which the wagons could, could run. Um, it was hard for these wagons because sometimes the roads were in poor shape. Uh, sometimes the roads were um, uh, filled with mud. Uh, it was quite an ordeal to get to get uh, to get these wagons to get down to Wilbur. Uh, this is a wonderful photo. This is uh, the Main Street in Hurley, New York. Uh, this is a photograph from um, Frank Almquist. Uh, as you know, Frank has just uh, written a wonderful book with loads of photos entitled uh, Building the Ashokan Reservoir. And this is, to me, is a wonderful photo. It's approximately, or postcard photo, it's approximately 1905. So this is when, uh, in West Hurley, the bluestone era was basically over. There was very little bluestone mining after 1900. Uh, but yet, the bluestone road uh, persists. And uh, not too many years after this, uh, West Hurley would have the West Hurley uh, citizens would have to vacate. And I think that vacation, that vacate year, uh, was 1913, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so that Bluestone Road apparently extended uh, down from the West Hurley area down Route 28A to, to Route 28 to Washington Avenue in Kingston. And here we're looking at uh, North Front Street. And we're heading up towards Wall Street. And this is a marvelous photo because it shows uh, in the foreground uh, these blue stone blocks, again, with the blue stone with the uh, tracks uh, in them. And this is this uh, photo is probably about 1890. So it, it shows you the extent of, of those blue stones roads that were constructed. Uh, on the right hand side of this photo is uh, Jacobus Bruns. Uh, stone house uh, that was removed uh, and the Peace Park in Uptown Kingston is now on that site. That's the corner with, uh, with Crown Street. And uh, this is an iconic photo that we've all seen. Uh, this is a uh, bluestone wagon. It's actually two wagons uh, together uh, being pulled by eight horses from North Front Street onto Wall Street. Um, Bob Donaldson, uh, who has written uh, some wonderful uh, uh, information on, uh, on Bluestone, particularly Bluestone articles in the, in the Freeman, uh, has said that uh, this stone um, was probably being transported in uh, eight, um, 1892. Uh, and he said that uh, its dimensions um, 
were probably 25 by 16 feet and that the stone weighed about 10 tons. So this corner is where Dominic's restaurant used to be. It's where the current Buns restaurant is located. Uh, the next photo uh, shows another uh, wagon, again, uh, laden uh, with a heavy stone. Uh, the back of this stone says 1890, a uh, stone being delivered to the Vanderbilt Mansion, uh, New York City. Uh, so the big stones often went to these wealthy uh, folks in, in New York City. Uh, this is from an Ed Ford collection photo. And uh, what would happen after Wall Street is these trucks would work their way down Wilbur Avenue uh, in Kingston and they'd end up at the Rondo uh, in Wilbur. And this is an 1875 lithograph of the Fitch building. Uh, there were two cousins, Simeon and William Fitch, uh, and they were prominent dealers in Bluestone, some of the largest dealers in the area. Uh, they started in about 1939. And this gives you an idea as you look uh, up the Rondo uh, of the extent of their stone yards uh, in the foreground, you can see that most of these are probably sidewalk slabs. And this is a view from the Fitch building, um, looking west uh, at those same yards. Uh, there's a schooner uh, that's present uh, on the left-hand side. And this is the Fitch building uh, after it was extensively restored uh, in about the 1970s. Uh, this is a beautiful bluestone construction. Uh, the architect was J.A. Wood, who did a lot of uh, prominent buildings in the Kingston, Ulster County, and Hudson Valley area. Um, the building doesn't look as good these days. Uh, it's in need of another, uh, another boost. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos uh, along the Rondo. Uh, in the back, you can see the West Shore Bridge. Um, this photo shows, the lar shows large blue stones being uh, loaded onto a schooner. Uh, looks like the boss is that pretty savvy guy in a black outfit there with that black black hat. Um, one thing you can notice here is that uh, these men all have hats on, but they're hardly hard hats, are they? And uh, OSHA would have a have a real problem with this kind of a business today. Uh, this is a wonderful photo. Probably dates from about uh, 1885, maybe. Uh, again, you can see the West Shore Railroad in the back. It shows three prominent industries. Uh, in the foreground, you see the bluestone slabs. There's an ice house near the bridge on the left-hand side. Uh, but the main thing you see across the way is a Portland cement factory. And that Portland cement factory is pretty significant because it was Portland cement uh, that brought a rather quick ending to the bluestone industry. Uh, in fact, uh, the Fitch uh, cousin's business uh, all of a sudden shut down uh, in 1895 because there was no longer uh, a demand for uh, sidewalk slabs. Uh, this is the last uh, uh, Bluestone uh, Depot that was in the uh, in Wilbur. Uh, it was the Sweeney Yard. Uh, this uh, this yard um, was the last yard in Wilbur functioning in 1895. And actually, soon after it was bought, uh, the yard was bought by Sam Kirkendall. And if you know anything about Kingston businesses, it seemed to be that Sam Kirkendall ended up owning them all. And he had a Hudson River uh, Bluestone Company that eventually owned all these uh, Bluestone yards in the Ulster County area. Um, the Sweeney Yard uh, except had um, significant land holdings in uh, West Hurley, town of Kingston, uh, Sawkill. Uh, and its products, uh, after being finished in the in those sheds that you can see, where they where the stone was cut, planed, and rubbed, um, were largely shipped to New York City. Um, one of the uh, big people in New York that liked his stones was the Tiffany Mansion, which I think was on Fifth Avenue. Uh, blue stones from the Sweeney Yard also went into uh, the link the um, Washington Monument in Washington and also into many federal buildings in Washington. And uh, this is um, an interesting photo, again, a Jack Matthews photo. Uh, and it shows Hewitt Boyce's uh, stone yard. Uh, it's behind those masts of that schooner. 
Uh, it was North uh, River Bluestone. Uh, you can see it's a pretty big operation. Uh, he started in about 1875. Uh, but the significance of Hewitt Boyce was the railroad. And running diagonally through this photo, you can see rail cars that are laden with blue stones. And it was, the, it was Hewitt Boyce who was able to bring stone uh, down on the uh, Ulster and Delaware uh, Railroad uh, from, from, say, up to Phoenicia, even, Boyceville, um, and uh, bring it down, bring his stone by rail uh, down to, to Kingston. Uh, previously, the stone wagons couldn't come down to Kingston because the hills uh, on uh, Broadway, Hasbrook Avenue were too steep to accommodate those stone wagons. Here's another photo of, uh, of Hewitt Boyce, Boyce's yard. Uh, these are looked like large flagstones, probably uh, stones for uh, New York City, Boston, maybe other Eastern Coast, uh, Eastern Coast uh, dex uh, destinations. Um, I'm going to show a few uh, what I think are interesting uh, bluestone slides. Um, I think uh, many of you in this audience may remember uh, when the roads uh, around the, uh, the dams and the reservoir uh, had uh, bluestone walls and bluestone coping. Um, here you, you can see um, um, the dividing weir between uh, the two parts of our, our reservoir. And again, uh, Here's another, I think, even more dramatic photo taken of the, uh, the western part of the reservoir, um, southwestern uh, part. Uh, the road that you see here would come from the main dam uh, coming from Route uh, 28A. Um, these uh, walls were taken down in the 1970s, um, according to a conversation that I had with Bruce Wistens. Um, the uh, stones were transported to Stone Road, uh, again, uh, uh, in the western part uh, of the town of Hurley, and apparently sold from, from that site. Uh, certainly, a lot of bluestone was garnered uh, from these beautiful walls. I don't know if many people will know where this photo is, but it's, it's a pretty neat one. Uh, it's the bridge abutment of the original railroad. Um, that extended uh, through the Ashokan Reservoir and headed into Kingston. Um, this site is, uh, is currently on Beesmer Road. Beesmer Road would extend from 28A, not too far from Morgan Hill Road, uh, and would extend over uh, to Route 28, uh, where the Harley Davidson um, dealership is. This photo uh, showing these beautiful abutments uh, was taken in 2014. And this past weekend, my wife and I went up just to take a look at it again. And we were surprised because this is what we saw. Uh, we only saw one bridge abutment. Uh, so within the past eight years, uh, the, the abutment on the right uh, has been removed. This is sort of a non sequitur photo, but some of you people may recognize this lady. Uh, this is Agnes Scott Smith. Uh, Agnes Scott Smith was uh, a well-known school teacher in the Kingston school system. Uh, she taught until 1969. Uh, she also was the leader of the paper named, named the Dame Rumor. And Agnes Scott Smith was born about 1898 in a farmhouse on Hurley Avenue, uh, which was taken down when the throughway overpass uh, came over Hurley Avenue. And Agnes Dot Smith has written some wonderful reminiscences uh, of her time in Kingston. And she describes at a very young age, so this would be perhaps 1904 or so, um, she describes seeing each day four to eight stone wagons coming by uh, her home on Hurley Avenue uh, heading towards North Front Street. Uh, she said in the memoir that these uh, wagons came from Lamontville, uh, which would be another ledge of bluestone that extends south from, from the areas that we have already been talking about. Um, it also points out to me that these bluestone wagons had to have come through the village of Hurley each day on their, on their way uh, to Hurley Avenue. Uh, this is such a wonderful structure, the old Dutch church. 
Um, again, it's made of bluestone. Um, and it dates back uh, to 1850. So what it points out was that by 1850, the bluestone business was really in full tilt. Um, this picture to me also shows the many different colors that bluestone can be. Uh, there's certainly browns, there's certainly light colors, there's certainly very dark colors. Uh, sometimes there can be purple or pinkish hues to, to the bluestone. The, the, uh, the name bluestone is interesting as well. It's, it's really descriptive of Ulster County bluestone. Uh, the name apparently derived in Ulster County. It doesn't have a geological uh, significance. It just represents a very hard sandstone. So those stones that uh, we see in the old Dutch church uh, started out uh, in a small quarry operation like this uh, uh, near West Hurley. Uh, the stones in the old Dutch church actually came from uh, two quarries. Uh, one was in Bristol Hill, uh, which is in the town of Hurley. And then the second quarry is Stony Hollow. Uh, Stony Hollow is, is up Route 28 near where the, the barbecue uh, restaurant is. And that was a real uh, focal point of, of bluestone uh, quarrying. So these would be quarriers. This would be a mill. Uh, perhaps people like this quarry the stones that are in the old Dutch church. So this uh, again uh, shows the village uh, of Hurley, shows the tailings that were present. Um, this is a wonderful photo uh, postcard from Frank Almquist of Hurley. Uh, showing bluestone sidewalks, and that would have been about 1905. And very soon after that, 1913, these people had to vacate for the reservoir. Uh, and today, uh, the scene looks like this. Um, the Hurley uh, Village, the West Hurley Village is gone. Um, the many uh, quarries that were there uh, are gone as well. And uh, now we have a reservoir. Uh, and an area that most of us very much enjoy uh, recreating about. Um, I thank you all for listening. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk about the bluestone industry in Hurley, and uh, I would welcome questions. If there are any, uh, any questions, you can unmute yourself and, and ask. I see that uh, Al Alexa had asked, in chat, uh, the chat feature, where are the big slabs now? Um, Pete? I think a lot of the big slabs were, um, were shipped from uh, the Rondout and went down to the big cities. And uh, some of the people that wanted these stones were the very wealthy uh, for their front sidewalks, for architectural features in their homes. So names like Vanderbilt, names like Tiffany had the stones. But even in Kingston, there's some interesting large stones. Uh, for example, on Wilbur Avenue, excuse me, on uh, Worth Street uh, near Spring Street, uh, there are two, co two columns that represent where uh, Thomas Cornell lived. And in front of Thomas Cornell's uh, house, there are two huge bluestone slabs. And, uh, they're attractive. One actually has a pinkish hue to, pinkish hue to it. It's, it's very attractive. So I, I think a lot of wealthy people were looking for these, for these stones. Uh, for example, there's a fair amount of bluestone in Newport, uh, in Boston, um, even as far south as uh, Charleston and even Havana. Um, it is mentioned, though, that a lot of these large stones were so large that they were difficult to handle. Uh, so they were cut up. Um, uh, down on the Rondout or perhaps, uh, you know, at quarry sites because they were too large to handle and, and perhaps didn't have an appropriate market. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, Pete, do you know when uh, the Bluestone sidewalks were laid in Midtown Kingston? Um, I think it's possible that that a lot of the sidewalks in Kingston were probably put down in uh, 18 by 1860 or so would be my thought. Mm -hmm. 
Because when I look at um, picturesque Ulster, I see bluestone sidewalks and curbs on Henry Street, but no road. So I guess the sidewalks went in before they paved the roads. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, there, there's just miles and miles of bluestone sidewalks in Kingston, and uh, they're in all different sections of town. They're really marvelous. And uh, it's due to people like you that we can, we can keep them as long as we can. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed this. Such a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lynn. I've got a question if I could ask. I don't know if I'm on. I don't. Yes, you are. OK, good. Uh, you uh, keep mentioning that the Bluestone was taken down into Kingston. Uh, you also mentioned that the road down Broadway um, is pretty steep and, and the wagons couldn't get down there. How did all that Bluestone Blue eventually get down to the Rondo? Um, I think there were two ways it got there. Number one, uh, a road had <clears throat> that hadn't been present was eventually uh, developed between Wilbur and Rondout, Pankaki area. So <clears throat> I know that Hewitt Boyce received some stones that came down through Wilbur and then got to his yard uh, in Pankaki. Um, but the, um, I think the big thing that happened was the railroad, uh, the Ulster and Delaware was able to bring stones <clears throat> from, from the, uh, the quarry areas by rail down to Hewitt Boyce's. Uh, yard. And I think that was a, a big change in what happened to the bluestone industry. Thank you. Any other uh, other questions? Hey, hey uh, Pete, do you know if there are any uh, active bluestone quarries locally? Um, I don't think so. I, um, I don't think there are any, any known commercial quarries, but I think there still are some uh, people who own private lands within the, the quarry regions uh, who have who are in old quarries that will pull stone out of those quarries. But I don't think there's any major <clears throat> bluestone dealers um, dealing in, uh, in Ulster County bluestone right now. I mean, a, lot of the bluestone, a lot of the bluestone business uh, ended up going down to the Delaware River area. Um, initially, uh, Sullivan County, Orange County, uh, and then Pike County in Pennsylvania. And there's still quarrying done in that region, but it's said that uh, the good stone really came from Ulster County. The stones that are from uh, the Delaware River area aren't, aren't as, uh, as thick. They're not as, col as nicely colored and they're not as durable as the old stones were from here. The man who did stonework for us, blue stone work for a patio and walls and another patio at two different houses has his own private um, blue stone quarry. A lot of what he takes out of there now is old scrap, but he still right. does beautiful work with it. That's Sean Fox. Okay. He's out in Olive Bridge. Interesting. When was the last? Uh, when was the last quarry, active quarry? That when did it close? Uh, did do you know that offhand? I I, I'm I'm not not particularly knowledgeable on that, but I do know that there was some quarrying done up until the 1950s uh, in the Sawk Hill That's area. Um, oh, you want your own? Yeah. Another question. So I'll start over. So, what is the relationship to the uh, between the bluestone industries and the brick industries? Were they contemporary? One followed the other. Uh, complementary, competitive. Uh, I I can't speak to competitiveness, but they certainly were oper operative, operating during the same time. Um, one primarily on the Hudson River, the other one on the Rondap. I think, um, you know, there was a great desire for brick in New York City and the metropolitan area. Um, that industry thrived for a long time, even uh, well beyond the bluestone industry's prominence. And I would say that, uh, that the bluestone industry complemented that in, in its uh, architectural uh, appeal. 
Thank you. Any other questions um, for uh, for Pete and our present our presenter tonight about bluestone uh, bluestone coring in Hurley? When um, this is Wayne Walagurski. Um, where I live now was originally um, the first house I bought was. Um, actually a bluestone quarry shack uh, and it was built in 1915 and I was just wondering how um because we have a lot of beautifully cut bluestone here on this property and um where was it cut it must have been cut on site do you have any info about that well I think a, a lot of the um the quarries uh, did did work on site. Uh, a lot of cutting was done on site, trimming, um, and then the the final uh, the final finishes were usually put on at the mills down down in the Rondout. Um, I I can't can't speak too much about for the area that that you're in. Um, I would imagine uh, uh, the the people that worked on your property had had skills that they used at, on the site, right? I would have to imagine, well, can't imagine, I, I, it's a definitive that um, they really knew what they were doing, because mm. there's an awful lot of bluestone here that uh, couldn't really be hauled around too easily. Sure. Uh, it's well, well cut, very square, um, and somebody actually knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Pete, do you do you have any information about the the people who who did uh, the manual most of the manual labor, the cutting? Um, uh, who, who were they typically, and um, what was their lives like? Do you know anything about that part? I, you know, as mentioned, uh, most of the people that worked in these quarries and I think also worked in the mills were, were Irish, uh, again, coming over largely uh, in the 1840s. And uh, the skill levels varied. Uh, a simple quarry worker would make $1.50 a day, whereas a guy who, who did the trimming and did the cutting, he was making three fifty dollars a day. Um, so I, I think that uh, probably the majority of people were, were of Irish uh, backgrounds and Irish, uh, Irish immigrants. And there were many small towns that developed. Uh, for example, in Woodstock, there was Lewis Hollow, um, where there was a very large uh, Irish community. Uh, there were large Irish communities in Jockey Hill, for example. Um, uh, that, uh, that had their own social lives and had their own villages uh, where they lived. Uh, of course, the, the, the quarries were owned by the wealthy landowners and were owned by the, the dealers down on the Rondout. And uh, it ended up the workers would have to pay a certain percentage of what they got to the people that owned the land. And then they'd have to pay a certain percentage to the, for people to take the quarry products down to Wilbur. And that could be pretty expensive uh, by those, those trucks. So yeah, I think there were a lot of uh, small communities that uh, developed around these, uh, around these quarries. If I may ask, was it a case then that the quarries just petered out or was it, um something else that was more um portland cement. it wasn't portland that? cement portland cement oh so oh, portland there other, cement there, some, there were some other other things too i think a lot of these quarries had been uh worked to the point where it was very difficult to take that topping off uh as they worked into the hillside the topping above the stone became much thicker and it became very expensive to try to remove that uh, there was also the problems of the rubbish that had been accumulated at the base of these mines. Uh, and of course, water and in, into the quarries played, played a role as well. 
Uh, but I think that uh, it became expensive, I think, to transport the bluestone. That was a big factor. Uh, and of course, um, the death knell was uh, the Portland cement sidewalks. And uh, mm. uh, there are there's some literature that, um, um, for example, in Clearwater's history of Ulster County, there's a statement that uh, there's enough bluestone to last forever uh, in Ulster County. It's such a wonderful uh, business. But yet, uh, a few years later, the industry was gone. So the bluestone is still here. Uh, it could still be quarried. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to hard to work through all the loopholes to do that. But the, the bluestone is, is still here. Thank you. Uh, Frank Omquist here. Uh, just a brief comment. The reservoir was worked on beginning in 1907. I'm sure there were workers around that new bluestone and the entire interior of the reservoir was what they called paved with pieces of bluestone standing on edge on all the dikes. And that was a tremendous amount of bluestone that was brought in, had to be quarried and probably cut into roughly 12 inch, 14 inch square pieces and stacked by hand. And that was a tremendous amount of work, tremendous amount of effort started as soon as the core walls were done. So when they started packing the interior base and the water side, I'm sure that the uh, bluestone stacking was, was underway. So it, it put a lot of bluestone workers busy, maybe working some of those old quarries. Uh, at least the early West Hurley ones, and maybe there were a couple of quarries under the reservoir as well. But the main quarry wa uh, dike walls were along the west, southwest side, southeast side of the reservoir from Brown Station around towards through West Hurley and around over towards the Woodstock Dike and then back up along the uh, the, the other uh, dike up going up along the, the ra new rail trail. So all that interior work all was all bluestone standing on edge. I'm sure I, we've all walked along that and gone down along towards the water, but it's mm -hmm. all that that bluestone that's tough to walk on, but it's it's there to prevent the erosion of the banking. Frank, that's a great point. Yes. Um, there's also, um, an interesting uh, quarry that you can now visit uh, up near the reservoir. It's called Yale Quarry. Uh, and it's a site where a lot of bluestone was taken for uh, building the reservoir and building those dikes. And its entrance is just beyond, is on 28A, uh, just beyond the uh, south uh, uh, and the, the south road that enters towards the, um, the main dam. Um, and it's, uh, it's well worth a visit. There are huge quarry walls. There, there are train uh, tracks uh, and also uh, uh, manufacturing facilities for stone uh, within that quarry. It's worth a visit, the oak quarry. Hmm. Wasn't there some quarry, bluestone quarrying done in Oniora Lake area? Where uh, yes. D D yeah. DC is? Yes, there's a... Uh, there's a huge bluestone quarry by Aniora Lake. Um, Lowell Thing in his writing has said that the quarry size is greater than a football, football field. And the side walls are up to 30 and 40 feet high. It's a very impressive uh, old quarry. That's true. Uh, Pete, uh, there was a, que there was a, a question um, here that uh, from um, Al Alexa about the um, bluestone roads with the grooves, were those yeah. grooves were those grooves made uh, uh, made ahead of time or did they develop over time? Uh, those grooves developed over time uh, from those iron-clad wheels that went over the bluestone. They weren't in there. They weren't there previously, apparently. So they were, it was smooth beforehand and then over just through wear and tear, so to speak, it, they apparently, it just- formed. Apparently that's the case, yep. Well, that's quite evident in the Hurley front yard because the grooves are not centered. They're just offset every which way, depending on how the slab was laid down. 
Wow. The, the uh, photo, the brown photo of the family uh, enterprise quarry and finishing thing, uh, the manager seems to have a steel rod about four feet long, maybe longer, uh, quarter inch or three eighths in diameter. And I've always assumed that it was a pointer to show the men which blocks to get out. But at one point, I thought maybe it was also a bouncing rod to listen to the density of the bluestone hmm. as it bounced. It would make a different pitch. Sure. Very good point. Wow. And I have a cleaned up version of that image if you want it. 